The first key, if you want to create more positive change that is, that's successful, that lasts, that sticks, you need to learn to think like a listener, not a tapper. A listener, not a tapper. How many of you read the book Made to Stick by the Heath Brothers? Any of you read that book? Well, in that book, in the introduction on page 19, they talk about a very fascinating study done by a PhD student back in 1990. Her name was Elizabeth Newton. Now, what Elizabeth did is she took a group of people together and she broke them into two groups, listeners and tappers. The tapper's job was to take a song, and she gave them a list of about 25 songs, and uh, they're common songs like Happy Birthday to You. And their job was to tap out the song. It was obviously the listener's job to listen and to try to correctly identify that song. Now, when they went to the test, only about 2% of the time did the listeners get it right. Now, in one sense, this makes sense, right? It's kind of hard to do. If I went tap, tap, to tap, 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 I mean, you'd go, what song is that? I mean, it's kind of hard to do. I mean, you could try it at your table, tap out happy birthday to you. And as, if you didn't know that, you'd be hard to figure that out, wouldn't it? What's fascinating, though, is that when they asked the tappers what percentage of the time did they think that the listeners would correctly guess what they tapped, they said 50% of the time. 50% of the time. Now, that is very interesting. And that led to what the Heath brothers call the curse of knowledge, or this is the way I like to put it. Once you know something to be true, it is very difficult to ever remember what it's like to not know that thing, right? Once you know happy birthday to you and you're trying to tap it out, try to tap it without hearing the song in your head. You can't do it. You can't because you're hearing it in your head. Now, this has massive implications for every leader who's trying to communicate anything with anyone. And even if you're not leading a big group, you might be leading a family. Okay, this works there too. So here are some implications and applications for those of you who are in executive roles. Number one, it is difficult to remember how employees, especially non-executive employees, think, feel, and act. Uh, many of us here have been in management for a long period of time. When was the last time you were not a manager? For some of you, it's been years. Uh, the last time I technically had an employee job, I was 16. I'm 49 now. It is, I try to think like them, I try to understand them, but it has been a long time since I've not been the leader of an organization. And some of you are in the same place. It is hard to think like them. It's been a long time for many of us. The second thought is that it's difficult to remember that everyone that you're working with does not have access to all the information that you have, right? You get reports that other people on your team don't get. You sit in meetings that they don't sit in on. You hear things. You do performance reviews of your people. Everyone else isn't in on those reviews. You know stuff that they don't know. And it's hard, once you know that stuff, to ever remember what it's like to not know that. In fact, earlier this afternoon, um, I went in to see my orthopedic surgeon. I had had my shoulder operated on a couple years ago, and I started having some pain again, so I went to see him on my way down here. Now, he's a great physician. He's got good personality. He's just a wonderful guy. did a great job. But you know what? He's a physician. And once he started trying to explain what was going on on my shoulder, he went into physician talk. And you know what that's like, right? And once he got into physician talk, I was just nodding my head, right? Because he's happy that I'm nodding my head, but I don't have a clue what he's talking about. And some of you who are programmers know this experience, right? When you're trying to talk to family members or someone else who doesn't understand and you're trying to explain something that to you seems so simple and they don't get it. Remember, once you have access to information that other people don't have, you can't think like them ever again because you know something they don't know. The third implication for those of us who are executives is that it's difficult to think the way other personalities think. Now, I don't care what your personality type is. Guess what? More people are not like you than like you. It doesn't matter, okay? There are more people who do not think like you than think like you. And so if you try to communicate in a way that you think should motivate somebody, I'm telling you, the majority of people, it won't motivate. Because they don't think like you, they don't feel like you, they don't act like you. I'm a big fan of Myers-Briggs. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Myers-Briggs, but here's a classic example. You have S's and N's. S's are sensors, N's are intuitives. Sensors like lots of data, they want proof. They want to touch it, taste it, see it, smell it, feel it kind of people. Intuitives go by their gut. So if you're an intuitive and you're trying to lead a, peop a group of people who are sensors and you're saying, hey, this is what we should do, and they're saying, well, what's the proof? And you're going, we don't need proof, right? You've got conflict. If on the other hand, you're a sensor and you're trying to go through all this data, the intuitive is saying, why are we wasting all this time, right? It doesn't matter what your personality type, the majority of people are not like you. 
And that's a problem that we learn from tappers and listeners. We're tappers trying to lead people who are listeners, and we've got to get outside of us. The fourth implication of this is that it's difficult to remember that employees don't care about all the things that you do, right? Uh, most of us have some vested interest. If we hit certain metrics or numbers, we get rewarded, right? Our employees often don't. So we don't understand, why don't you care about this metric? Well, they don't care because they don't get anything from that. But you and I care about that because it means something for us. So if you are a leader and you're a tapper, you've got to remember the majority of the people that you're leading are listeners and they don't think, act, and feel like you at all. And so if you want to create change, you've got to get outside of you and into them. Now, so some of you like some practical ideas, so let me give you a couple of them. And we'll do this for each one of the principles. Number one, uh, I'd encourage you to study Myers-Briggs or some other personality typology. And I really don't care what it is. But what happens if you understand personality typologies is it becomes speed reading for you. Yesterday I sat down with a potential client and he started talking about his business partner. And he starts talking about his business partner, I immediately thought, that guy's an SP. And so I said to him, I said, well, I bet you your partner doesn't like this, this, and this, but they really like doing this, this, and this. And he looks at me and he goes, how did you know? This is not, nothing magical. I just happen to know Myers-Briggs pretty well, right? And so if you find some kind of personality typology that helps you understand how people think and act and feel different than you, then you can start to think more like them. Second, you can create an employee profile. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, just start looking at your direct reports. What stresses them out? What motivates them? What demotivates them? What do they like? What do they dislike? And get all your direct reports, because I guarantee you most of them don't think like you. If you want to create change, you've got to get inside them, because people are motivated for their reasons, not ours. And the last thought here is learn to use quadruple thinking, quadruple thinking. By the way, you see all those underlines? That, those are the underlines in the notes you don't have to fill in. Woohoo! Okay. So quadruple thinking. John Stott came up with this idea years ago. And uh, this is great for communication in any realm, including business. You think about what you want to say. Then you think about how the person's going to hear what you say. Then you rethink what you want to say so that they will hear what you want them to hear. Quadruple thinking. One, two, three, four. Great communication rule. Because you have to get outside of you. If I say, you know, we need to cut costs, what my people out there in my company might be thinking is someone's going to lose their job, right? That's what they're thinking. Or I'm going to have to do more with less. Now, you might not be thinking at all that you need to cut anybody. You might be thinking that we actually need to change some technology to be able to increase some efficiencies so we can increase our margin. But if you don't communicate in a way that connects with them, they're automatically going to start thinking what they think. So you always practice quadruple thinking. And if any of you are married, that's a great tip. So can you do this? Can you learn to think like a listener instead of a tapper? Absolutely. And by the way, uh, I did this presentation. The reason I'm here probably is at an AIM meeting with a bunch of executives back in March. And as I started going through this around this point, one of the people said, and it was a smaller group, so it was more intimate so we could have interaction. And one of the people said, you know, Bruce, this sounds like an awful lot of work. I mean, why can't we just tell people what they're supposed to do and make them do it? And before I could respond, somebody else in the room said, how's that working for you? 